Welcome back to another build video. This is going to be about the Mackie C224 Gori, the 132nd scale Big Bird from Italy. This is just going to be the first part of the whole build process because I want to make the most out of it in terms of uh, enjoyment and in terms of video content. So this video is going to only focus on the landing gear bay and doors and the engine. Now how many more there are going to be, I don't know it yet because I'm still working on a cockpit and uh, yeah, it might be two, it might be three, but that's something that the future will hold. So let's not waste any more time and let's get right into the build. And look how excited I was, well, this excitement did diminish quite a bit over the time. So I do want to address a couple of things whilst you can watch me build up the bulk of the engine. Trust me, there is nothing really peculiar at this point in terms of the build. So my overall experience so far is pretty much mediocre. And by that I mean is that compared to other newly tooled kits which came out not too long ago, it doesn't really come close in terms of quality. But this is just my opinion. So you might not like it, you might agree with it, it's really up to you. I really do feel like that for this kit, the biggest selling point is that it is a full gore after all. And there is nothing really else on the market that can come even close to this one right now. If this would have been a Spitfire, people would have been freaking out and saying that like this is not even worth the time and effort when you have such kits out in the market like the Katari one or the 124th scale Airfix. And I haven't seen the Katari one in person, but I did see, you know, the review videos, the unboxings, the images, and yeah, this doesn't even come close, except that this has an engine, but this engine is nothing special so yeah if you like the full glory as much as i do or even more then i would say buy the kit but but at least wait until it gets cheaper because 100 euros or british pounds it's just not worth it in my opinion but again this is my opinion take it or leave it so to talk about besides rambling uh, about the build you can see that the bulk of the engine goes together fairly well there are going to be some parts which I need to then sprue glue a bit and then sand but other than that it was okay Now we are going to assemble the turbo intake. This is the first part where you are going to be introduced to some photo etch. Which is, I think, was a bit of a bad engineering from Italy's part because they could have omitted that photo etch part quite easily and it wouldn't have made any difference in quality. This is due to the simple fact that that piece of photo etch will go inside of the turbo intake so it is going to be really hard to see anyway and because the other thing that it's quite a simple etching so it could have been plastic through and through and you can also see that uh, the fit is not quite good there is going to be a gap which I had to fill in with sprue glue And with this, my friends, the Sprugu session has officially started. It is going to be quite a common 
tool that I reach out for during the build. Now I'm going to assemble the front of the engine where the shaft is for the propeller. Always keep a lookout for extra plastic flashes because they, they are going to be quite common in the small holes and uh, other small cracks and openings. Now the shaft looks quite short so I don't know how well the propeller is going to fit on it without gluing. I would really like to see other manufacturers use the Tamiya away with the small rubber gasket that makes the props removable, I think is just a genius idea. Now this is another thing here. This part, which has this shaft sticking out, has quite a bit of a leeway when it comes to fitting it into position. Now this doesn't sound that bad you know to have a bit of a wiggle room but the thing is that if you manage to position the shaft just even half a millimeter away from center the propeller is going to look bad it it is going to be off from the structure and you will have an ugly gap and misalignment in the end and you don't really want to have that right so I don't understand why they couldn't provide proper holes and locator pins here. In a build like this, where a tiny amounts of fractions of millimeters misalignment can add up, you really don't want to have this kind of fitting. You really want to have everything fitting tightly neatly as much as possible now these parts as well have a very loose fit so to speak and of course they are going to be not visible if you have the bottom cowling on as probably i will as well and in the end, they can be a problem when it comes to fitting the exhaust. Another two tiny pieces of photo edge, but these actually make sense because uh, these go onto the side of the previously glued two plastic parts, which can't really be molded without slide molding it. But uh, yeah, this is a simpler option. Otherwise, yeah, these could have been plastic as well. And here we go, we have arrived at our first ejector pin mark. Now this tiny part is going to be on the bottom of the engine, which in most cases probably not going to bother anyone. But if you want to have a fully exposed engine, this ejector pin mark is in a very bad place. And this theme is going to be a very common one with this kit like this ejector pin mark as well which is going to be on the top part of the engine so you really want to get rid of this one
And on the positive side, these two pipe works go on quite nicely. I guess they fall into place. They are not wiggling around, so that's good. This front part needs to be cut off of the tiny piece because uh, there is already a pipe work in place where this would go in. I can imagine that this uh, Daimler Benz engine will be used in other places. Possibly that's why you have these access parts that need to be removed. If you look closely, there is a bit of a seam line on the top, but I use some uh, Tamiya Extra Fin to try to smooth out the surface. I don't know what this tiny piece on the top of the engine is but on pictures I did see that some kind of tubing should come out of there and go down on the side of the engine which is not there of course. And now you see another big problem which you will come across with this kit. It's called seam lines and there are quite a few of them. And most of the time they are going to be quite prominent and it's not going to look nice on small or very thin parts like this. And look what we just found here as well. The seam lines best friend, ejector pin mark. And well, this is quite of a crater, I should say. Here I pre-assemble the engine frame parts, so it's going to be easier to put it all together after painting. And if you look closely, you can still see some ejector pin marks, but I didn't care too much about them because hopefully they are going to be covered by the engine block itself. And now that everything is ready for painting, well, let's get into painting. First off, I am going to use Mission Models Black Primer. For anyone who might ask, I use a 50-50 ratio of thinner and primer. You, know, you don't need the polyurethane from them, because the primer already has that in it. Luckily, there is not much of a color scheme for the engine, it's either black or metallic, well, certain parts of it, that is. And sorry for this camera angle, it's not the best I know because you really want to see the plastic being painted and not the back of my left hand, right? Slowly but surely I will get the hang of it, let's say in two years tops, so if you can just try to be, be a bit patient, okay? Now 
now I switch to metallic so whatever needs to be metallic is going to be metallic in this case uh, the engine frame and some parts of the engine oh and of course for your information I use AK extreme metals steel color in this case I do love these colors these are really really good Now I'm going to use a light gray, like a ghost gray, to do some highlighting with dry brush on the whole engine block. I did do a bit of an oopsie on the top, but I kept it like that. I think it will count as like a, well not battle damage, but rather, you know, wear and tear on the protective black coating of the engine block. Now I'm giving green coating to these uh, tubes, pipes on the side of the engine. I don't really know them what they are, so please, if you know, let me know in the comments. Um, yeah, the green was uh, proposed by the instructions, so I just went with it. I think it looks nice. Here I use metal aluminum to paint all the wiring for the spark plugs. Oh, and here you can see me also use a bit more of that AK Extreme Metal Steel color to color in where the exhaust will go. And if you haven't noticed, I also use this color to color in those mounting points as well on the top of the engine. Now this one you really don't have to do because again this is the bottom part of the engine which is going to be covered by the bottom cowling so I did and and painted it green anyway because the instruction said so After everything has been painted on the main block, now let's get to the assembly part. I have nothing to complain about this step either, everything went together well. Well, the perhaps the turbo intake did pose a bit of a problem, it's just, again, uh, I don't know what they were thinking when they made that inner part of it photo etch, it just doesn't make any sense.
Now here I'm mixing Mission Models Tire Black with some water and a tiny 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 amount of their thinner. I am making just a water-based acrylic wash for the metallic back part of the engine. Now the tiny amount of thinner helps to break up the surface tension and it will change the viscosity of the wash for the better. So here I'm just using this very light wash to accentuate all these tiny parts on the back. Of course it's not as aggressive as an enamel wash but I think it does do the trick. Not gonna lie, this is quite a subtle difference that it makes. And the eagle-eyed ones, you might have spotted those nice seam lines which I forgot to clean up but I'm not going to bother at this point because the guns will cover it. And here we go, mistake number one, using the supplied tubes. And I say, don't do it, they are bad, they are too thick, they are too rigid or too hard, so they are not too soft, so they are not going to be bendy. And another mistake is, don't cut them on the size that they propose. They are too big. Just look at that. Look at that. It's like almost twice as big as the pipe work that you put it on. It's ridiculous. It looks god awful. But at this point I still carried on because I thought it might work, but it doesn't. Don't even bother, just throw them away as far as you can. Awful, just awful. What was I thinking? Well, what was Italy thinking? Ridiculous. And mistake number two, or was it three now? Doesn't matter. Another mistake, don't put the engine into its frame until everything is done. And by everything I mean to put in that, uh, well, you will see later on, but assemble all that pipe work uh, with the bendy parts before you would put the engine into the frame because you want to paint, paint those as well and it's just not going to work out well. Now just adding some of the last tiny separate parts to the engine. So this is the part I was referring to to do before you put the frame around the engine. 
this T shape needs to be glued together with the two tubes coming out from the engine and then you're going to have a third tube underneath. Now you want to have these all in the right size and paint it up before you put the frame around it or you're going to have a bad time. The reason why I was avoiding f painting these flexible tubes at this point because uh, potential risk of uh, the acrylic paints flaking off from their surface as I bend them. Of course in hindsight I think it wouldn't have been a problem due to you really bend them just a little amount whilst you're trying to put it into place and really that's about it. Now I paint this white shape plastic part bit with AK Interactive Extreme Metal as well. And here it is, mistake numero 4. Don't use these black tubings and definitely don't glue them on those little knobs on the side of the engine because they are in the wrong position there. If you do glue them on there, they will flex outwards so much that you're not going to be able to put the cowling on top properly. So here I am trying to correct my mistake, finding some kind of household item that I can use. So I ended up using an old a headphone of mine and use it the cables as you can see it's much more flexible much easier to handle and it's not as girthy as the one supplied by Italeri so here I am redoing all the tubes behind the engine with this newfound solution of mine. I'm not going to bore you with the details how painstaking it was to get off the already glued on tubes and cleaning up the residue of the CA glue. So let's move away from the engine parts a bit and let's get into building the closed landing gears. There are two oil tanks, I guess they are oil tanks or something or other that need, need to be built and which will go on top of the landing gear bay. These are very simplistic, made out of three parts. Putting them together is not hard, but again there are no location pin marks so you have to wiggle them around a bit to make sure that everything fits together nicely. Well, I should correct myself, this bigger one actually has two locator pins, so that's good. But you have to look out for some little fine detail, because that is only on one side, so you don't want to accidentally glue it uh, the other way around, and then you lose that tiny amount of detail it has. Again, here you can see that one side of the tank is blank and the other one has this tiny amount of rivet detail. So that rivet detail needs to be on the side where it is actually visible. I don't understand why they didn't think that it could be manageable to print both sides the same way so they have the same detail so people accidentally don't, don't, don't fall into this trap. It's just 
beyond me. Another, let's say, saving grace, perhaps, for me at least, is with this kit that they actually provide you parts for closed landing gears, which is not too common, sadly, still. You do need to do a bit of cutting here, but it is manageable. Now, first, I did glue in the middle section, and uh, how I approached it that uh, was that I glued together the two halves in the middle where these hinges are and then put it into place i don't know if this if this is the best approach but it certainly worked for me now it might look like that these hinges will protrude quite a bit but i looked at some of the photos of uh, of the undercarriage side of the plane and they really look like that and really protruding so i think it's okay there is a bit of a lip, I should say, alongside the opening of the bay. Uh, so, so these uh, hatches will catch onto that and uh, sit on top. There is one exception though, but more on that later. Now with these two pieces there weren't any problems at all, they just fall right into the, to their place and it's done. Now these are the panels which I was referring to having a bit of a problem. They really don't have a lip there to catch on, so they are falling through quite easily. So I try to hold them in place with my finger or using masking tape as you see here. There is a U-shaped piece that goes within the gear bay which should hold this in place when you do the landing gears closed. So just keep that in mind to glue that first in before you do this. Now those last two pieces at the ends of the gear base, those are fine. They have the lip service to catch on to. And here is another shining example how bad the engineering is. This part doesn't have any kind of locator pin, so it can freely move around in its place as it sees fit. So just make sure as you position it that it is in the correct position. Second of all, just look at the inside. It has massive ejector pin marks and really nasty. So if you build this plane with open landing gears, which I presume a lot of you are going to do, you have to take care of those nasty pieces right there because it's just ugly. And of course there is a nasty little ejector pin mark right there which I managed to overlook so I tried to fill it afterwards with some sprue glue and just uh, dilute it so much that it will spread and flatten evenly. Don't try to think too much into this view right now. This is the firewall and there is a hmm, interestingly shaped little pipe that protrudes outwards. Hmm.
And now these are the U-shaped parts which I was referring to when I've assembled the gear doors. Some more photo etch, but these are quite handy as well because they will go and cover up the wing roots from the inside. Now the instructions doesn't say or it already doesn't provide an alternative uh, retracted piston but I did use these as these are the ones which push or pull the, gear, the landing gears and uh, when you do close landing gears but you want to have an open engine rough you might see into it so much that if there is no piston showing that's just weird isn't it so i did cut these off and then cut off the extension and just glue them into their places and here you can see another great example of bad engineering look how much wiggle room that part has in there it's just ridiculous it's uh yeah i don't know what to say it's just bad as you can see I ended up using a plier to crush that part a bit and then just sanded off uh, like the imperfections what the what the plier uh, teeth did to the plastic And here I use the, the leftover piston rod for some extra detail. So this is the finished firewall with the gear bay closed and covered up. So let's get into painting then shall we? I hope this angle is going to be much better now than the previous one when I did the engine and you will see a bit more of the whole process. As you might have guessed, this is again Mission Models Gray Primer and I primed the gear bay and the smaller oil tank. Well, you know what? This angle is not that great either, or at least the focus point of the camera is bad because it keeps on focusing on my hand again and not the plastic. So sorry about that folks. Here I use the same mixture what I had from uh, Regiana 2000 build which was 70% uh, RAF sky grey and 30% Russian emerald green. And of course both paints are from Mission Models. For the small tank I use deep green from ammo. Sorry for not showing how I made the bigger tank but I did prime that with black mission models primer during the process when I did the engine and then I did cover it with the same AK Extreme Metals steel color.
Now before this panel washing thing that you see here, I did varnish the whole part, but I know it's going to sound blasphemous coming from me, but I did use a different varnish than Mission Model ones. I do like Mission Model varnishes, they are really good, but I wanted to try something new. So I went with BMS's satin varnish for this and I should say they are fantastic. The way it dries, this eggshell finish and uh, there are no imperfections and anything and, and you don't even have to thin it. It really goes as they say it in their videos. I was blown away. I think they are one of the best at this point or at least from all the ones that I've tried. I still like Mission Model ones, but I think I have a new favorite. And I presume you also want me to address this new panel lining tool, or pen, should I say? Well, I don't think that this is the right place for the use, for you have these very um, intruding parts and detail, because it was a chore to actually have the paint flowing out from it so I think when it comes to these kind of surfaces use just the good old paintbrush technique now that's not to say that I'm not going to try this tool again when I am doing the fully assembled planes actual panel lines but until then I will say that this is not the way to use it After I covered the whole thing with panel wash, like with my slobbering technique, as I used to say, then I grabbed my trusty cotton bud after 25-30 minutes and started to rub off all the excess. I figured that because it's a, it's a gear bay where you have these two tanks as well on top and you have the engine on top as well, you're going to be, have a lot of greases and oils flowing everywhere so yeah making it nice and dirty I don't think it's going to be too unrealistic as I'm gluing in the whole engine and its frame I hold it in place with some masking tape just for the heads up you can see right here how much these two black tubes come out on the sides from those knobs it's it's not going to work afterwards i even tested it to putting the cowling on on the top and yeah it is not going to work nicely and when you bend it too much the tubes to make it more closer to the engine side that's not going to look nice either so what I ended up doing is that I went back to my previously decimated headphone cables and I took out some wires. Luckily they were both in different colors, one is green, one is red. And according to the instructions, you should paint those black tubes in two different colors. So I think this will be good enough. I know now that these wires aren't going to look like tubings or pipework, but at this point, I will be honest, don't really care. So I went ahead and I trimmed them to be the same length as the black tube should have been. Luckily, that kind of length, what the instructions say for those tubes, those are fine. Now, I did had to cut off those pins that were there to put the tubes on so I cut them off I sand it back the surface then use some CA glue to glue in these two wires in place funnily enough I don't know why but the green cable went on perfectly fine I had no trouble at all to glue that in place as you see here but the red one, well, this is now cut footage, but I was like frustrated because for 15 minutes, it just didn't want to get stuck to the plastic. And I really didn't know what the cause was really. So yeah, that was a nightmare.
Here you can see how I tucked in both cable ends behind those green pipe work so it's not really apparent where it goes to or where it comes out from. I think it will be fine and to be honest when I looked at uh, Italy's Instagram where they have a built Mackie 202 there on the pictures you can see the same solution well not with a cable of course but it's pretty much the same solution it is tucked behind that pipe you also saw me that I removed the pin and then colored it and here it is mistake number five I think uh, well, this is the result of the mistake that I haven't painted all these white tubings to green. Now you can see me suffer. There is not much room to get close to them. So yeah, it was a uh, mind numbing work to try and paint every visible part of it. But I bet that this kind of suffering does further your skills in brush painting and uh, hand to brush coordination. So in the end, I might have won something out of this. We are getting close to the end, boys. I am gluing in some uh, left out struts that need to be on both sides of the, the engine frame. Doing some extra painting here on that bottom boxy thing I used gunmetal grey and uh, on the top thing above that I used the same green that I used for the, for the pipe work and of course just to say something negative these parts are very bland and they have no extra detail on them whatsoever so I do wonder if they look the same on the actual aircraft. And here we are, the final varnish coat. Again, I used VMS satin varnish and it went on perfectly. And actually it looks really nice how the whole thing turned out with that varnish on top. It really pulled all the colors, all the things together. And it is done. Although you can see that I didn't provide you a video on how I did the wash afterwards on it to accentuate some parts of the engine and the frame but let's be honest it's a simple wash work and we are at that point in time in this video where I think everybody had enough including myself so to turn back to the topic of whether this kit is good or not uh, I will say it's a mediocre kit it's definitely not worth the price that you can buy it right now. The only saving grace is that it is a Mackie 202, as I said before. There are loads of seam lines everywhere. There are big problems with the massive, massive holes that they made during uh, with the ejection pins. The detail work is, is bad and uh, you haven't even seen the cockpit yet. You haven't seen even the cockpit yet and I can tell you I was furious still am actually again if this would have been any other plane a BF 109 a Stuka a Spitfire a Hurricane you name it if this would have been any other plane this kit would be so mediocre and everybody would dunk on it saying that Man, this is ridiculous. Buy a Kotare, buy a border model, buy Tamiya, buy anything else, but don't buy this kit because this kit is bad. Well, compared to those kits, what you can buy for the same price or even less. But because there is no competition to a Maki 202 right now, it can live on, which is in some extent fine because we finally have something, finally. But again, wait and don't buy because it's not worth it. Or at least wait until other third parties, aftermarket manufacturers pick up the slack and they do some 
some extra stuff for it that will make it a much better better viable kit but then again you spend 100 euros on the kit and then you spend god knows how much on extras so that's not a really good option either now is it i was so hopeful i was so excited and hopeful about this kit thinking that italeri they will go out of their way and make the best maki to to uh, you can get for a long while so that this kit will be like 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 the top tier of Italian planes and uh, no and sadly it's not and 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 I'm and I'm and I'm very I'm very upset because of this I will still try to get the most out of it I will still enjoy it because it's a Mackie Toto I really want the Mackie Toto that looks decent and I think it is going to deliver on that but <sighs> I'm sorry I'm just yeah I am out of words uh, to even try to describe how I feel and uh, yeah anyway the rest of the plane is ongoing and hopefully I will have that soon as well for your viewing pleasure and until then Feel free to share your thoughts on, on this uh, on this warbird in, in the comments below. And let me know if you agree or disagree. That's perfectly fine. You know, um, we can have different opinions. I'm not going to look differently on others because of that. So I am hoping you will treat me the same um, and my opinions. And yeah, um, like and subscribe and uh, see you on the next one.